join me in the call to worship? Fear not, Christ has risen. Cast away your doubt, Christ is risen. Rejoice in the name of the Lord. Witness with song and praise. Let all nations proclaim proclaim God's God's love. Alleluia. Christ is risen. Lord, we know following the risen Christ brings joy as well as challenges. We rejoice when he appears in both the familiar and the unexpected. May the eyes of our hearts see the risen one as we walk together, demanding path of discipleship. And may hear your voice and trust the call along the way. Amen. Please join me in saying the litany for the season of Easter. When they had finished eating, Jesus asked, Do you truly love me with your whole heart and life more than these? Yes, Lord. We know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus asked, no, I am asking you, do you truly love me with all that you are? Yes, Lord, you know that I love you, even if I don't always live up to who I want to be. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. Then for a third time, Jesus asked, do you love me? Feed my sheep. Please stand if you're comfortable and sing hymn 173. Scripture for the day is John tap, chapter 21, verses 1 to 19. After these things, Jesus manifested himself again to the disciples of the Sea of Tiberias, and he manifested himself in this way Simon Peter and Thomas called Dynamis, and Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee, and the sons of Zebedee. And two other of his disciples were together. Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. They said to him, We will also come with you. They went out and got into the boat, 
and that night they caught nothing. But when the day was now breaking, Jesus stood on the beach, yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. So Jesus said to them, Children, you do not have any fish, do you? They answered him, No. And he said to them, Cast the net on the right-hand side of the boat, and you will find a catch. So they cast, and then they were not able to haul it in because of the great number of fish. Therefore, the disciples whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It is the Lord. So when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put, on, he put his outer garment on, for he was stripped for work, and threw himself into the sea. But the other disciples came in a little boat, for they were not far from land, but about 100 yards away, dragging the full net full of fish. So when they got out onto the land, they saw a charcoal fire already laid and fish placed on it and bread. Jesus said to them, Bring some of the fish which you have now caught. Simon Peter went up and drew the net to land, full of large fish. 153, and although there were so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, Come have breakfast. None of the disciples ventured to question him, Who are you? Knowing that it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them, and the fish likewise. This is now the third time that Jesus was manifested to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. So when they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, Tend my lambs. He said to him again a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, Shepherd my sheep. He said to him a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him a third time, Do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, Tend my sheep. Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were younger, you used to gird yourself and walk wherever you wished. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will gird you and bring you where you do not wish to go. Now this he said, signifying by what kind of death he would glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he said, Follow me. God is still speaking. Thanks be to God.
please be seated. Let us pray. Come, O Lord, and quiet our hearts and minds. Help us to hear that portion of the word that was shared just for us this morning. Help us to put together the words within our hearts to profess our love for Jesus. And may the words of your holy word and the words that are within our heart provide the strength that is necessary and needed for living out our life together as a resurrection community. And may the meditations that come from the recalling of those words and the thoughts and the wanderings somehow find their way into action, work that will be pleasing and acceptable to you and for the building up of your kingdom here on earth. Amen. And so this morning we're listening and have heard the last resurrection story from the final chapter of the Gospel according to St. John. And if I was to give a title to this reflection, it would be The Echoes of the Empty Tomb. And so this story are some of the final echoes as recorded by St. John when Jesus appears to seven disciples, count them seven, the 11 that were at the end of the story are not there. There are seven gathered on the shores of the Sea of Tiberias. We have moved from Jerusalem to Galilee. We're back on the home turf. And if you can imagine that this is a story that is recording not so much a historical event, but a story that is being told to a local congregation, maybe in Galilee, maybe the gathering of John's disciples, John's followers of Jesus, those disciples who gathered with him, and they're reflecting on what they have heard or known of in terms of resurrection stories. It's well after the death of Jesus, but there is that, that wanting and that desire to retell the story, to listen with the heart of what took place and where Jesus was seen and how others came to declare, I have seen the Lord. But it's interesting that the story begins with the disciples having returned to their usual and customary way of life. Peter declares to his friends, I'm going fishing. And of course, it wasn't picking up his trout pole and going for a recreational fish. It was, I'm going fishing because I'm hungry. My family's hungry. We need to earn some money. And the others join in and help. And so immediately we know something about resurrection and that in the stage that's set by this gospel story, Resurrection first appears by breaking into the usual and the customary. Resurrection breaks in when Peter and his fellow disciples decide to do what they know how to do best, go fishing. And so a new day dawns at the same time as they're getting ready to go fishing. A new day dawns, the gospel tells us. A new life begins. A new day begins the disciples are off casting their nets, and there Christ appears in the usual and the customary. And he's there on the beach, we're told. He's not too far away from the disciples as they're casting their nets from the boat. He's close enough, and some translations actually have measured it to 100 yards. I don't know how they came up with that, but he's, he's within shouting distance. And Jesus calls out to them, hey, have you caught anything out there? 
disciples, they shrug their shoulders, they look at him with disappointment and say, no, we really haven't caught a thing. Jesus instructs them to throw the nets onto the other side of the boat. We're told also that the disciples did not recognize him. So resurrection not only appears in the usual and customary, but resurrection takes place and we don't even recognize it. Just as the disciples didn't recognize Jesus from the distance between them and the boat. And from that instruction that Jesus, that simple try the other side, of course we heard from Niles that the, the whole net was filled up and there was a catch so big they couldn't even haul it in. We're told that in the case of resurrection, you can expect bounty more than the usual amount. That when you come into relationship with the resurrected Lord, that you can expect things to surprise you and to overwhelm you with goodness. It's a sign of resurrection abundance. And so the disciples somehow get that net and they get back onto the shore and Jesus, with help or by himself, the risen one, there's a fire there, there's a charcoal fire ready for the roasting and of fish, and there's bread. And so Jesus invites his friends, who don't yet recognize him fully, to breakfast. And in resurrection, there's fellowship. It's usual and customary stuff that resurrection breaks into. It's also the, the matter of not recognizing when resurrection happens. It's also the matter of abundance, but it's also the matter of Christian fellowship. Resurrection happens in the midst of community. It's not a solo enterprise all the time. It's not the encounter of just seeing the Lord myself. It's seeing the Lord as a community as those who sit at a common table and share with one another. And so they gather for breakfast with Jesus, and he shares the, the fish and the bread, and it's after finishing their meal that, that Jesus opens this conversation with Peter. And it's a heart-to-heart -heart conversation. Is it chit-chat? It isn't just a, hey, how you doing, Peter? It's a heart-to-heart -heart conversation, for there is not time to waste. Resurrection happens when two hearts connect in a conversation. When two hearts share pain, joy, thanksgiving, fellowship, whatever it is, when two hearts find themselves linked together in warmth, there's resurrection. And that's what Jesus was after with Peter a public resurrection moment between him and Peter so others could, could listen in. Could listen in with the ears of their hearts. The first sentence of the prologue to the rule of St. Benedict reads as follows. And I quote, remember this is St. Benedict writing to monks, so it's not gender inclusive. And I quote, Listen carefully, my son, to the master's instructions and attend to them with the ear of your heart. When the late M. Basil Pennington, a Trappist monk, abbot, wrote his reflections on this rule, it was a collection of essays that he had put together from conversations that he had with his, his community of monks in different locations. And he wrote this in the book titled, Listen with Your Heart, Spiritual Living with the Rule of St. Benedict. He said that the whole rule is summed up in those first two words. The whole rule of St. Benedict, if you're familiar with it, it is quite lengthy. But M. Basil Pennington says, all you need really to know is listen carefully. 
my son. There's more than two words there. But somehow he puts it to two words. And I think what he means is, listen, son. And so for this morning's reflection, let us turn our attention to the words of listen and attend. Let's add those two words. To listen and attend with the ear of your heart. That's all I want you to try to do this morning. Is to listen with the ears of your hearts and to join me in that same exercise because I believe when we're able to listen with the ears of our hearts, we're able to hear the echoes of the empty tomb. The words that come to us this morning from the brief conversation between the risen Jesus and Simon Peter are words for the heart and words that open us to resurrection life. Those words that Peter and Jesus shared, there weren't very many. There were questions, do you love me? And then, of course, the words of frustration from Peter back and forth. And then the instructions on how to live your life. Jesus simply asks Peter three times if he loves him, and each question comes with instruction, whether you like to just remember, feed my sheep or feed my lambs, feed my sheep, feed my lambs, tempt to them, whatever one that appears to you, remember one of them. Let yourself listen with the ears of your heart. Jesus adds at the end of the conversation words about the life of a mature disciple. Compares it to a young disciple. When you're a young disciple, you wander where you want, you go where you want. But when you're a mature disciple, when your love relationship with Jesus matures, you're led to places where you would rather not go. And then finally, Jesus in the conversation ends with his call. To follow. The echoes of the empty tomb are not limited to this gospel story. Niles again did a wonderful job to tell us the story. I've recounted it with you. But that's not the end of the story. The story continues to unfold. That's why we need to listen with the ears of our hearts to, to hear the resurrection stories that continue to be told in the midst of the community and outside of the community in the usual and customary where we recognize it or not in the matter of fellowship and community always expecting the abundance. The echoes of the empty tomb are not limited to the gospel stories in any of the gospels. We cherish them. We're thankful to our ancient ancestors who put them down into scrolls and passed them on to us. But they're not meant to limit the gospel. For it is a living story. The story of Easter. The gospel invites us to listen and to listen hard with the ears of our hearts. You've heard gospel resurrection stories over and over again. And I'm sure that you've heard resurrection stories. And maybe you've heard some people, friends or family, retell a resurrection story over and over again too. But the resurrection is... That, that, that remembrance of what may have happened in the past to us that we claim as resurrection, but we also have the stories that are happening right now. We're in the midst of resurrection. We're in the midst of a hope for resurrection. We've heard them before, whether we recognize them or not. And we've seen living resurrection stories, living resurrection stories. Stories about people who we did not expect would make it. In whatever way you consider making it, whether it's a physical, spiritual, social, professional, economic, whatever it is, you expect, oh, no, this is the end. But no, it wasn't. Resurrection stories, whether we recognize them or not. 
And I suggest to you, as we call from this gospel story from St. John this morning, at the core of a story about the resurrection, whether it comes from the gospel or it's a story that you retell or you're living right now, at the core of resurrection is love. Is love. That's why I believe that Jesus kept pushing Peter not only because Peter denied Jesus three times, uh, that's biblical history for many and suggests that maybe this was a response to that. I believe that that could be part of it, but most important that Jesus wanted to make sure that, that his disciples were anchored in the resurrection and were anchored in the power of resurrection, which comes from love. Love for Christ love for the people of God, and of course, love of God. For love begets courage. And love begets compassion. Love begets mercy and forgiveness, and all of those are elements of resurrection. When you tell your resurrection stories or you experience them with others, you, you can pull out of them the core elements of love and compassion and forgiveness and mercy, those, those elements of, of human re representation of God, making it visible. And resurrection happens in those places where we rather not go. How many times have you wondered how you got into a certain place at a certain time and you probably wouldn't have chosen to have been there if you had a choice. Or maybe you had to make a choice to go someplace where you really didn't want to go. But it was at that place where God wanted you to be at that particular time with that particular person or a group of people. And somehow the Spirit comes and gathers those situations and people together and you find yourself in the midst of a resurrection moment. Or maybe you didn't, but after thinking about it and talking with others, something did happen. Maybe it's something that you said that you didn't really think was a, a matter of resurrection language, but later in conversation with an individual you found that what you had said had changed his or her life or way of thinking or decision. And in fact, it led to new life, a new way of being. And so it could be a simple matter of sitting at a kitchen table, uh, listening to the echoes of the empty tomb, a heart-to-heart -heart conversation where the love for Jesus is wide open. Or maybe it's simply on the way to work or traveling on the T, you're overhearing in an unusual but customary place a resurrection story being shared. And of course, in the beauty of the creations of the poets, the songwriters, the novelists, you hear the echoes of the empty tomb. These words that come together, source from the heart, that give us an opportunity to reflect and to listen carefully and prayerfully with the ears of our hearts that allow us to hear the echoes of the empty tomb. The echoes of the empty tomb are heard any time when love defeats the powers of death. The powers of death that are manifested in re rejection when one is rejected by another. The power of love, the echoes of the empty tomb are heard when alienation is denied and inclusion is brought into reality. And the echoes of the empty tomb are heard when oppression is reversed and liberation is found. 
Jesus invites us all into an intimate heart-to-heart relationship. It's not just for Peter, those questions. They're for us. They're for you and I. Imagine Jesus asking you right now, do you love me? And then following up with the instructions to go and feed my sheep, tend my sheep, care for my flock. And I would add, experience the resurrection. Listen for the sounds of the empty tomb. And lastly, I I really believe from this text that Jesus needed to get to a certain point. The risen Christ, the the resurrection church had to get to a certain point in the story where, where Jesus could not see a future for his disciples. He could not send them out. He could not commission them to go forth in mission if they could not <laughs> proclaim their love for him. Because it would be love that would fuel the mission. Just as Jesus washed the feet of the disciples and said, go forth and do the same, let the world know of your love for me and your love for your neighbor. Jesus knew that his disciples would not be able to follow him without hearing his voice. And so he asked these questions. And he asked the questions that go directly to the ears of the heart. And so I pray that as we finish our Easter season together, that we continue to listen to one another as we listen to the text, our sacred text, the Gospels, the Hebrew Bible, as we listen carefully with the ears of our hearts and and try to, to find exactly, if we can, the best way to listen so we can find our way as Jesus sends us forward in love and love for the world. Where he may be leading us is not clear yet. But that clarity will come with love, with compassion and mercy. Because that is what is at the source of resurrection. And as a resurrection people, in the midst of a resurrection project, it's the work that we have to do. First, to listen and to expect resurrection. Let us pray. Gracious God, as we prepare to come to your table, we ask that you open the ears and the eyes of our hearts so we may hear your voice and see your path. Help us to claim the identity of being your resurrection community and to lean forward in the hope and the promise of new life and to be the beacons of that hope and that promise in the world. Amen. I invite you to join me in prayer. as we reflect more on this word, but also on our life together. I want to share with you something that I meant to share last Sunday. I had uh, exchanged a few texts with uh, Jen Myhawk to see how her first Easter was up there in Underhill, Vermont. And uh, she told me things went well. But she also told me this, some of you may already know this, that uh, Jen and Chris are expecting their first child. So if that is not news to you, and you know Jen Myhawk and Chris Larson, I hope that you'll extend to them your your joy as well. So please uh, keep them in your prayers. Lord, we're ever grateful for these resurrection Stories, these glimpses that we have heard in this place. And we know that there are others to be told. And we know that there are others to be born. We give you thanks 
and celebrate for those that are on the path of recovery, resurrecting life. Whether it's for four months or four years, we praise and we thank you for every minute, second, hour of that resurrection path. We pray, O oh Lord, and give thanks for a new life as we have heard the good news of the arrival of Lily. And we pray, O oh God, for all who are seeking a new home, not simply new shelter, but a place to call home, where they, those that are seeking, our friends and our family, can open their hearts to one another and to strangers alike, and to open their ears in their eyes for the possibilities of what you're doing in your midst. We pray and we give you thanks, O oh Lord, for the opportunity to hear about the needs of others. And we pray for Millie. And we pray that somehow a place will be found so that she can come and receive her treatment. And if it's for us to be part of that enterprise, O oh Lord, make it be known. And we pray for Jen and Chris as they await new life. We ask you, O oh God, to be with us as we listen to resurrection stories, as we participate in them as major and minor characters, as we head off in new adventures and new ways that you've called us, that you will continuously remind us of your love for us and for our ways to love you. In your holy name we pray. Amen. I invite you to offer yourselves and your gifts to the resurrection enterprise of Jesus Christ in this place and far away.
our prayer of thanksgiving and dedication. Lord, we offer our minds and hearts. Please be seated. Lord, we humbly offer our praise and thanks. Blessed are we, you welcomed to this feast of love. In unity with you, Jesus set this table for all to enjoy. Send your life-giving spirit into our midst. Renew our hearts and ready our hands for the work of Jesus. Today we remember when Jesus asked Simon Peter three times, Do you love me? And how three times Simon Peter answered yes. Jesus then responded with instructions to care for his flock. So now we receive the broken body of Jesus, acknowledging it is our task to do the same, caring for one another and stranger alike. May all who share in this feast gain strength for the work of Christ. Sing to God. Sing, Sing praises, praises to the Lord. Lord. Out of God's love for all creation, Jesus joined his heart with the hungry and tired. Jesus extended his hands to the sick and the dying. Jesus loved the forgotten and despised. And the Lord has called us to do the same, to live compassionate lives in service to his flock. Blessed are we who live in the light of God's promise. Glory, Glory to God, God, our creator and Savior. The word of Jesus is ours to share. The sacrifice of Jesus is ours to receive. Blessed are we who gather together. We thank you. Let us remember how Jesus made God's love visible. He lifted a loaf of bread, and while thanking God, broke open the bread to share it with his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body. Jesus, with gratitude to God, lifted a cup of grape juice and wine. Passing the cup to his disciples, he shared the good news of God's promise of forgiving love, saying, drink from this, all of you. As we gather at the Lord's table to remember God's acts of love, we bow in the name above all names, confessing with one voice, Jesus Christ is Lord in proclaiming to heaven and earth. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Lord, send your spirit to bless these gifts of your harvest. May these simple symbols of your love unite us with Jesus. Fill us, O God, with your love and mercy and strengthen us for the building up of your kingdom here on earth. Amen. Let us pray together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name.
to gain the strength for going out into the world to bring the resurrection message and to live the resurrection life. Come, let us feast together. Eternal God, we give you thanks for this holy mystery in which you have given yourself to us. Grant that we may go into the world in the strength of your spirit to give ourselves for others. In the name of Jesus Christ, the risen one, we pray. Amen. I invite you to take a brief moment to exchange a sign of Christ's peace and love and reconciliation with those most close to you in your pews. I invite you to return to your seats. There will be uh, ample time for fellowship downstairs and the wonderful love feast that's been prepared for us. We're so grateful for that. I hope that all of you can partake in some way. Let us conclude our time of worship together as we stand, if you're comfortable doing so, singing our last hymn, More Love to Thee. We'll be singing verses 1 and 4. have shared in the cup and the bread. We have received spiritual nourishment. And now it's our task to find ways to go out into the world to love Christ. To love Christ in the other. To love Christ in the one who is desperately looking for a source of that love that transcends any Thing he or she has experienced. That love that comes from the heart of an individual who has been listening with the ears of the heart, with compassion and mercy, and the true desire to be Christ in the world. That is our task. Go forth in peace and undertake that work, the work of discipleship. Please be seated. Thank <laughs> you.